divers. Today, we have the pleasure of interviewing an absolutely amazing guest. We have a noted speaker for Harvard Medical School, Cleveland Clinic, MGMA, ACHE, author of the Emerging Healthcare Leader, educator at Creighton University, mentor to many, including myself, and truly one of the most remarkable, accomplished, and humble individuals I think I have ever been privileged to know. So, Lori Bedke, we are so honored to have you on the show today. Thank you. Lori. It is my pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so, we have a, a host of questions for you today. I'm so thankful that you don't mind us interrogating you. And um, I think Kem is probably most excited to, to kick things off. So Kem, I will, I'll let you go first. You go right on ahead. Absolutely. Lori, oh my gosh, it's such a pleasure to have you on today. I mean, you're a powerhouse keynote speaker. You're an author, podcaster, an educator. You clearly have the ability to help motivate, elevate, and inspire. Tell me, you know, if you could push one message to the cell phone of every healthcare leader in the nation, what would you say? Wow, we are just jumping into the deep end right out of the gate. <laughs> I love it. Uh, you're, you're individuals after my own heart. Wow. So that's a really superb question. And it could be the entirety of our, of our dialogue today. But I think the one thing that's incredibly important is to, to know thyself. Mm. I don't think that any of us can effectively lead others if we are not effectively leading ourselves. And so my challenge to myself and to healthcare leaders or leaders in any discipline is to take the time consistently, intentionally, intermittently throughout the course of your career um, to make sure that you know yourself, get to know your strengths, get to know your weaknesses, get to know, um, you know, where, where you thrive and what work fills you up and where you have a a, a ridiculous capacity to do hard work um, amid complexity and challenge and adversity and even short resource, but it actually fuels you. And then also get to know what work is, you know, going to drain you and what you're perhaps competent to do, but could never with reliability and sustainably sustainability do. And that is true for all of us. And so if we know that about ourselves and can more intentionally give ourselves adjacency to the work that we're drawn toward and where uh, we thrive. Um, and then we, as a leader, lead that by example, but then encourage others around us to do the same. It will drive performance. It will drive engagement. Um, but if I can only say one thing, that's it. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, podcast over guys. There, there it is. There's the gem. I got, oh my goodness, Lori, you always have such such poignant notes. Um, I, you told me so many things, even while I was in the MBA program and just listening to your own mm -hmm. podcast, you've spoken all over the place. You speak for Cleveland Clinic, Harvard Medical School. You are a true thought leader. And one thing I know you've spoken a lot about, we've chatted a lot about it. I've spread uh, the words that you have said to me to so many colleagues. Um, is, you know, about imposter syndrome, right? That is an equal opportunity afflictor. It, it goes across ages, it goes across genders, industries, um, even, you know, experience. There's individuals with imposter syndrome who have been in an industry for 10 years, and there's those that have been it for four decades that are still struggling with it. So how do we as healthcare leaders work to overcome imposter syndrome? That's a great question. And there is a, there's a ton of literature and there's a ton of really superb content around this. But I think the thing to remind ourselves is that imposter syndrome is a natural collateral consequence of our leveling up in our careers, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the risk factors or the risk factor for imposter phenomenon is being a high achiever. And so if you're someone who's pursuing greatness or wants to contribute excellence to the work that you do now, but preparing yourself for that next level of leadership or, you know, expanding outside your comfort zone or taking on something new, or I don't know, just, you know, being a part of a massively disrupted and complex uh, industry like healthcare, it's very natural that we're going to experience it. And so I think knowing that 
helps to normalize that it's not necessarily a super negative thing. It doesn't make it any less hard, but it means, oh, well, maybe that means I'm actually doing something right. And so one of the next best steps that we can do when we're experiencing it is to talk about it, to have people around us um, who are trusted colleagues, who are mentoring us, who um, give us sound counsel, or from time to time, if you need it, um, you know, talking to a coach or someone else to help to really examine what's the root of this and how can I get out of my own way and just continue nevertheless. And so the fact that that exists, we have to, I think, own and acknowledge also the power of our mindset. What we believe about ourselves manifests itself in how we show up. And so if we are wrestling with that, it can be a powerful force in, you know, negatively impacting our ability to perform at a high level or to rise up to the challenges or to be humble and collaborate or delegate or, or defer to someone else where we need to. But I think the reason why it's important to have other people around us, A, they can talk us out of our own head, but B, they can also confirm for us that they have struggled with it. And I don't know about you, but any time that I'm talking to colleagues, mentors, uh, other remarkable individuals, it never ceases to amaze me when I'm I'm looking at someone and I'm looking at like I'm looking at the two of you at someone who's competent and credible and well respected and well trained and has a uh, you know with good reason acumen in their space, but they tell me about a failure. They tell me that they wrestle with imposter syndrome or they have bad days or they've stumbled and skinned their knee or fumbled. It's not that I relish their pain in that moment or the experience of a failure or a setback or a hardship or you know those mental mindset battles that we all have to, to, to dance with, to tango with in, in leadership, but rather it just validates that hard is normal because leadership is hard, life is hard. Parenting is hard. Friendships are hard. All of it is hard. Hard is normal. And when we see others authentically walking through the journey and experiencing hard also, and those are people that we respect and admire and are, and are competent, it helps us to adjust our mind to, you know, the normalcy that is how hard the journey actually is in every way, the actual work itself, the way we look at it, um, and everything else also. Wow. <laughs> oh my gosh. That was, <laughs> I'm just, you like, know, like, I have to, I need a minute to just, wow. Do you not just love her? <laughs> oh my gosh. That was so powerful. And I think that's going to resonate with, that resonates with so many leaders and, and folks who are, who are on the journey to be, you know, the, their real self. I mean, Wow, Lori, that's so powerful. So much effort goes into writing, publishing, and the recording process. And you know, I, I hear that you just wrapped the audio version of the Emerging Healthcare Leader with Natalie Lamberton. You've truly accomplished and achieved so much. What's next on your list? Wow. Well, thank you. Yes, we have, my co-author Natalie and I have, have taught for ACHE for about 14 years now, and we've written two editions of the book, The Emerging Healthcare Leader, and it was just released uh, as an audio book, and uh, it is just so exciting to have it available in that forum. I'm an avid reader, but I love to consume the majority of my books uh, via audiobook, and so I've been advocating for that with our publisher for uh, a couple of years, and I'm so excited for it. But man, I mean, there's always an endless to-do list and, and a goal list. I am actually uh, working on another book project, but I'll be really honest and say, I think my biggest goals right now are to slow down and to love on the people that are right here. Um, I'm in a season of life where I've got two teenagers. My daughter starts her senior year of high school today, and my son starts his sophomore year, and those years are going fast. And so I'm, I'm working really hard to be intentional, to slow down and, and be present um, and savor them. Um, I'm also um, really, really mindful of the fact that the programs that I lead here at Creighton University 
are filled with adult learners that are frontline healthcare professionals. And so honestly, my top priority is in cueing myself and reminding myself to not chase. And I'm a goal chaser. I'm a, I'm a horizon mentality person, but I am, am trying very hard to just be present for and wrap my brain and my presence and my access or availability around those amazing leaders who are, who've chosen to belly up to the bar that, that Taya <laughs> bellied up to a couple of years ago, which is a really rigorous graduate degree program, but with, um, you know, without the awareness or, or uh, knowledge of exactly what type of a, a frying pan or crucible we'd be living in right now because of this global pandemic. And so um, if I can be just, you know, very candid, that's my biggest priority right now. And that's, that's my goal um, is to make sure that I can really love on those people who, who, um, you know, are right here in, in the programs that I lead and in my own home um, and, and not sacrifice any of the need there for my temptation to chase. And let me tell you, um, I've got plenty of temptation to chase, but um, it, it, to me, it's the right investment right now. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I can tell you having gone through that program, being a mentee, being a fan and a friend, um, I absolutely can tell that that nurturing spirit of yours comes out and, and wraps around all of those around you. And I also think that that's something all of us need to hear, right? Re regardless of that desire to chase and that desire to achieve, we do need to take those moments to, to slow down and to refill our own cup, as you have told me many, many times, which I have told Kim um, and passed that one on. Uh, <laughs> we can't pour into others' cups unless we have refilled our own. And, you know, when we think of the, the Rev Divers that we have listening in, I think sometimes, you know, we equate achievement and, and drive into resiliency. But we're really mindful that, you know, rev cycle and, and those dealing with it, it can quickly lead to burnout. And where is that intersection between resiliency and burnout? And, you know, how do we recognize that in ourselves? I mean, clearly, you know, based on what you just said, you recognize, you know what, I need to take a moment. I need to step back and to, and to recenter my priorities. How do we do that and recognize that within ourselves and in our employees and and what do we do once we've recognized that? Yeah, man, I, I know that I will be doing a disservice to the abundance of literature on this topic of resilience and burnout, because it's a vast and very complicated and nuanced topic. Um, but I think that this most significant exacerbant right now of burnout is uncertainty just this compounding, long-standing um, uncertainty. And that's probably, um, you know, when you're thinking about rev cycle reimbursement and the, the realities of healthcare in our regulatory environment, in our, in our financial uh, ecosystem over the last 5, 10, 20 years, there's been so much shift in that space, which has driven uncertainty. But in the last 17 months, that has been exponentially more so. And so I think that knowing that uncertainty and the extended presence or reality of uncertainty um, undoubtedly has a very negative consequence for any of us, especially those of us who lean a little bit more type A, like in our control and structure, <laughs> raising both hands. Yeah, that is me. Um, but when that is not necessarily possible, I think the thing that we need to do for ourselves, but certainly for those of us who are leading teams, is to work to nurture as much transparency as possible, because we might not have all the answers and the goal line might be shifting. But as a leader, if I can confirm for people who are looking to me as, you know, as the voice of of authority or um, to, to be kind of the rock around them, transparency is going to nurture trust. And even if there's not a lot of control and, and autonomy and influence over environment is another significant contributor to burnout, 
Um, mm -hmm. And so when uncertainty abounds and autonomy is gone, we need to rely on a couple of anchors and transparency nurtures trust so that even if my boss not might not, or I might not have complete control over or awareness of what's around the corner, if I trust that he or she is going to be transparent with me and provide as much assurance, communication, clarity as possible, then I can navigate as effectively and functionally as possible the uncertainty that abounds and it helps to quell some of those frustrations. Um, and I think for any of us, that practice of, of gratitude, focusing on what among all of the, the litany of things that, that might be wrong or frustrating or stressors or, or unideal, suboptimal, what can I be grateful for? You know, and, and so identifying even those tiny elements um, are things that can help us to make sure that we retain even the most small amounts um, of resilience and well being that then fuels um, our ability to continue to show up, to perform, and to rise to those challenges. <laughs> I can't wait to, to listen back to this podcast. I know. I think that <laughs> instead of doing like morning affirmations, I'm just going to keep replaying Lori in this one because these are really, truly poignant messages we need to hear so often. Um, yeah. Just truly. You know what's funny? Um, many years ago, when my daughter was in um, middle school, and it was take your child to work day, I had brought her to a conference that I was attending. It was well a seminar, you know, in person back in the day when we used to actually be able to do that. And <laughs> <laughs> when we when we left and we were going back to my office back to work, she said, "So is this kind of like?" therapy for business people like you guys just all get together and Aww. someone talks and kind of gives you guys ideas and you guys kind of you know because I, I can't she kind of heard all of us kind of you know sharing our experiences and I was like wow that was so insightful um but you know I think every every leader is coming from um a, a different starting point. And what, right, what we see is in healthcare, a lot of leaders start from the front desk, they kind of move into billing, and we we get kind of, you know, on the job training. And I mm -hmm. think, you know, Lori, as for you, as, as a professor, um, and now you're, you know, assistant dean of um, physician leadership and education um, at, at Creighton, you see the value, obviously, of undergraduate and, and graduate level education. Um, can you share you know, your thoughts about how that's really helping healthcare um, you know, a, as a whole, having leaders getting this, this foundation of education? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think that um, when I think about the need that exists and what really inspires uh, me to, to chase the challenges that exist in the academic programs that I lead and the work that I do in the healthcare industry and other professional associations. That is that it's been my experience throughout my healthcare career. And, um, you know, you just took me right back to the beginning of my career when I came out of undergrad and was getting my graduate degree. I started in a physician practice at a healthcare system here in the Omaha community. As a, um, as a referral specialist, <laughs> back when HMOs and PPOs required a primary care referral in order to see a specialist, you know, and then I worked my way up and, um, and was in physician practice leadership roles in employed health systems for a number of years before I identified my passion to, um, you know, to be a speaker and to consult with healthcare organizations and, and now um, having what I truly believe is a dream job uh, here at Creighton University. But it's interesting to me because my observations over those decades is that in we, we are, we're in such a, uh, an interdisciplinary world in healthcare, whether you're in an academic health center or an academic medical center, whether you're in a, in a critical access hospital in a, in a rural community, whether you're in a private physician practice or any in between, it takes 
so many different team members and integral players to rise up to the challenges of delivering healthcare in each of those environments. And so the interesting fact about that though, to answer your question is that the acuity of training and development for physicians, for nurses, for physical therapists, for pharmacists, for nurse practitioners and PAs and all of the other healthcare professionals um, clinically or non-clinically is that your acute training in that technical knowledge that's required um, is, is great. And we all need that competence that allows us to perform that element of our job but as you prove yourself competent in those individual contributor roles, you're typically asked to rise or up to a leadership role. And the things that are the biggest challenges for you and the things that are what you're asked to, to lead is not a process or a deliverable as much as it's influencing change or it inspiring or equipping collaboration in others. And so therein lies a delta that exists for most individuals, as they ascend into those leadership roles, now they realize they need new arrows in their quiver. And there's a delta that exists between what they've trained so acutely and so rigorously to be able to do. And now if they're leading others who do that work, they're also now, you know, a part of the strategic planning process, or, you know, they're navigating change management conversations, or they're accountable for a budget and they're hiring and recruiting and doing performance management and, and all of the other things that are a part of leadership. And so I think that big challenge is that, you know, there's always more to be learned. And especially as it pertains to leading teams and that human dynamic of, you know, human behavior and, and organizational behavior, um, there is so much to be learned, and there there's an entirely new skill set that's involved um, in in leading in healthcare. And so so many choose to come back and be a part of another uh, graduate degree, which um, in healthcare we seem to do incredibly well is is to stack up that alphabet name behind our our uh, names <laughs> alphabet soup. <laughs> behind our names uh, on our business cards or on our email signature that is all of the credentials. And because everything is so nuanced, even within revenue cycle, there are so many different segments <laughs> of or domains of expertise, right? And so I guess in short, we need to have robust credibility and competence in the area where we have trained, but we also need to be very mindful to give ourselves the awareness and to hone new skill sets and, and uh, competencies as it pertains to being able to lead the broader enterprise. And frankly, it's my deep belief um, that we need individuals that are diverse in their understanding and representation, um, both in terms of that domain expertise, clinicians leading healthcare organizations, individuals with a, a healthcare IT background or a revenue cycle, um, having a seat at the table and being influential in making core decisions because it takes that interdisciplinary approach um, to make sure that we are considering where we've been and how we design more effective teams and healthcare organizations uh, for the future. Absolutely. What a, just what a phenomenal answer to that question. And you know, to speak to some of that diversity, I mean, in the program that I went through, you know, our, our cohort that we had, we had, you know, homegrown practice administrators that had, you know, then gotten their undergrad and graduate degrees. We had pharmacists, we had physicians, we had nurses. Um, there is just an understanding that we need that foundational knowledge. And um, I highly encourage anybody listening to go out and listen to, to Lori's podcast. It's Growth Edge. You can find it pretty much anywhere you can listen to our podcast as well. Um, if you want these pearls of wisdom on a regular basis, I highly recommend anybody to, to go out and listen to Lori's podcast there or to download that new audiobook which is phenomenal and you can just grab it right on audible um it's just amazing the emerging healthcare leader is now on audiobook i just cannot believe it <laughs> well last but not least Lori, i am so thankful that you joined us today but i would be completely remiss if i did not take this opportunity to learn something from you and um 
I definitely already have on this call, as with every discussion that we have. But please tell me, is there something we should have asked you today that we didn't, or something you think we should know about you? Uh, well, I will just say, I think my, my call to action for anyone listening, and I include myself in this because this is a daily reminder for me, is just to take care of yourself. Taya, you said earlier something I'm fond of, of encouraging is, and that is that we can't pour from an empty vessel. And so as much as the challenges um, at our doorstep and, you know, our inbox and our calendars and our to-do lists will beckon us to just continue to grind, I think no one but us can take care of us and it, we can't lead others effectively if we don't lead ourselves. And, and so I know that a huge challenge of mine and I'm guessing of yours and, and the listener as well is just giving yourself permission to, or, or being reminded of the importance of investing in your own well-being, so that you can continue to rise up to those challenges. So carry on my friends. Thank you for this opportunity to share. Lori, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been an absolute pleasure. I cannot wait for um, our listeners to, to really be able to dig into this podcast. Um, for everyone who's joined us today, thank you so much for joining. We look forward to the next episode. Lori, we look forward to having you again sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure.